So I'm Benny. I will start with a little bit about me. I currently work at cPanel as the manager of community engagement. Before, essentially that means that I run the community team. Before that, I was the first community manager. I convinced them that we needed to talk to folks that actually used the cPanel side of our product and not just web hosts, which is who we've been really good at talking to for a lot of years. Before that, I worked in tech support remotely. I worked sitting next to my pit bull puppy and in my pajamas most days at, in my house in Michigan. The, if you've never done tech support, I'm sure most of you have used tech support in one, one way or another, but if you've never actually done it, um, at cPanel at least, it's mostly an email-based interaction. Uh, we don't do much phone support. And most people are very nice and very easy to interact with and very easy to, to help. But I still maintain that you've never truly lived until you have gotten an, a legitimate death threat over a software bug. So before that, I uh, worked at a company called Liquid Web. You, you've probably heard of them. I built their monitoring team and their monitoring department, the Sonar monitoring product. By the time I left there, we had a team of 16 people with two or three every shift monitoring the 20,000 servers, around 120,000 services. Uh, we would get an average of about 600 alerts a minute that we had to respond to. So that was, that was always fun. Trial by fire. The, it was intense, but it also meant that you learned a lot very quickly. And so that was one of my favorite parts about that job. Before that, I ran VoIP through an old Sears building that had been converted into office spaces. I managed a specialty toy store. And let me tell you, there is no one more intense on the planet than the grandmother who is on Christmas Eve trying desperately to find the Thomas the Tank Engine uh, little toy that her grandson wants and Santa has promised. Those ladies are intense. Uh, but it was a good time. That's all I'm gonna tell you about me. Let's talk about DNS for a second. That's why you're here. If you, I've, everyone here obviously knows websites. You've used them, you might have built them. There's a, a component that most people don't think about when they're building websites or when they're interacting with websites. DNS translates the domain name that you type into the URL browser, or the URL, URL bar of your browser, into an IP address because the IP addresses are actually how computers do the communicating. Uh, when you type Google into your, your address bar, it actually translates it into one of those two IP addresses, either IPv4 or IPv6. If you've heard either, has anybody, is anybody not familiar with those two, IPv4 and IPv6? You guys know what that is? Cool then uh, obviously it, it translates into that. I'm going to, there's a, a group of people that put together a really quick video that goes through how it all works in a very interactive and fun way. They put it together for, uh, with the uh, hope of educating uh, policymakers. So we will watch that real quick because they do a way better job than I, I could in the same amount of time. Help. Okay, let's begin. The domain name system is indisputably one of the most important and overlooked parts of the internet. Without DNS, the internet as we know it today would collapse, and we would all be licking stamps to pay our bills, driving to an actual store to purchase something, reading the newspaper to see what movies were showing, or buying little round pieces of plastic called CDs to get our music. <laughs> How can we say that DNS is this important? We all know, or should know, that the computers that make up the internet are set up in large networks that communicate with each other via underground or underwater wires and are identified using strings of numbers known as IP addresses. Since the majority of us lack the mental capacity to sort through and retain hundreds of numerical series, DNS is used to translate an actual name into these numbers. But how does the domain name system work? In a web browser, let's say you enter the URL www.example.com as a, 
well as an example. When you type www.example.com into your address bar, you will actually be looking for www.example.com dot. Yes, there is a dot at the end of the domain name, one that you never see and one that you never type. When you type in www.google.com, you are actually going to the page www.google.com dot. Seriously, try it out. Oh wait. Okay, look, that's long enough. Anyway, that end dot represents the root of the internet's namespace. The root. Why is this so important? Because this is where it all begins. When you first search for www.example.com dot, your browser and your operating system will first determine if they know what the IP address is already. It could be configured on your computer, or it could be in memory, what the cool kids call cash. No, not cash as in cash money. The memory cache. C-A-C-H-E. Keep up, will ya? Anyway, so the browser asks the operating system and they both don't know where www.example.com dot is. What happens next? The operating system is configured to ask a resolving name server for IP addresses it does not know. The resolving name server is the workhorse of the DNS lookup. It is either configured manually or automatically within your operating system. Your operating system asks, or queries, the resolving name server for www.example.com. The resolving name server may or may not have this in memory, or, you know, cache. Yes, the C-A-C-H-E one, not that, never mind. For the sake of this demonstration, it does not. The only thing that all resolving name servers should know is where to find the root name servers. Yes, that enigmatic dot that appears at the end of every domain name you type into that address bar. The root name servers will reply with, I don't know, but I do know where to find the com name servers. Try there. The com name servers are called the top level domain name servers or TLD name servers. The resolving name server then takes all of this information from the root name servers, puts it in its cache, and then goes directly to the com TLD name servers. When the resolving name server queries www.example.com, the TLD name servers respond, I don't know but I do know where to find the example.com name servers. Try there. This next set of name servers are the authoritative name servers. So how did the comtld name servers know which authoritative name servers to use? With the help of the domain's registrar. When a domain is purchased, the registrar is told which authoritative name servers that domain should use. They notify the organization responsible for the top level domain, the registry, and tell them to update the TLD name servers. So anyway, the resolving name server takes the response from the TLD name server, stores it in cache, and then queries the example.com name servers. At this point, the authoritative name server will say, Hey, I know where that is. Tell your browser to go to the IP address 192.168.1.1. The resolving name server takes this information from the authoritative name server, puts it in cache, and gives a reply to the operating system. The operating system then gives this to the browser, and the browser then makes a connection to the IP address requesting the web page for www.example.com. Pretty cool, huh? While the process seems complex, and believe me, it is, this whole cycle takes less time than it takes you to blink an eye. DNS was designed to work extremely fast and efficiently. It is an integral part of the internet. Once you understand this, you can clearly see the many different facets and organizations that are responsible for a single DNS lookup. One lookup! There is a resolving name server, the root name server, the TLD name servers, and the authoritative name servers. If anyone were to dramatically change or filter any part of the DNS process, it could lead to disaster. This is why we believe the people with the power- We're gonna start getting into the policy side of things again, but that essentially covers how it, the, the whole process works in a very pretty way, right? So to kind of recap, you type the, the, the domain in, it goes to the local remote re resolving server, either in the cache on your computer or in your ISP's cache. Then if your computer doesn't have it, it goes to the ISP's cache, and then it goes to the root servers, and then it goes, once that, that the, the root server doesn't have it, it goes to your name servers, right? And says, oh yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, if you're hosting the DNS for your domains, that means that your server is the authoritative name server. So it makes things easy when you, when you manage your own DNS like that. If you are not hosting your name servers, that means your name servers are hosted probably with, if you're, if you're like, for example, if you're using GoDaddy, they have a name server service that you can use for their, your DNS. That, that means that instead of coming to your server 
for the, all of the information that it wants, it's going to go to GoDaddy's name servers. From a host's perspective, if you're attempting to diagnose a problem or attempting to make sure that a configuration is correct, you're going to look at the authoritative name servers that are defined at the registrar and make sure that they're pointing to the right place. So if, for example, cPanel, cPanel.com's name servers, authoritative name servers are ns1.cPanel.com and ns2.cPanel.com. Those are servers that we house in our data center. At our registrar, because we have to register our domain just like everybody else, we've defined that those name servers are the right ones. The DNS configuration has to be right on those servers in order for it to work everywhere. Right? Follow me so far? From a user's uh, uh, perspective, that, that leap is hard because if you are not, like if I log into my cPanel server and I look at my zone file, I'm not going to know that necessarily if I, if I don't understand how it works, that this file isn't the right place to look if I don't understand that the name server isn't here. So that gets kind of confusing sometimes. Um, and knowing where to look is 99% of diagnosing any kind of DNS issue that comes up. Once you know that part of it, you're set. The gotyas are the hard part. Uh, the, the, all of the caching that gets done through that whole process that we just watched, where I go here and I get this information, then I put it in my cache, and then I go deliver it over here. There's now, what, four different places that that information is stored in a cache. The way to, there's, there's two, if you have to make a DNS change, there, you have to wait for that cache to expire, right? The, in your zone file, there's a thing called a TTL or a time to live. The time to live is, de determines how long that cache will live. So if I made a change in my DNS right now, and my time to live is set to four hours, which is most often the default, then my, the, the change won't propagate out to the internet for four hours. So that's one of those things most web hosts will say up to 24 hours, because there are a couple of uh, a fair number of names, uh, caching name servers or resolving name servers that don't respect time to live, and we'll say this time this cache is going to live for 24 hours because I'm I'm not going to bother to look it up again until I want to. Um, if you and that's what what propagation is. If you've ever heard oh, somebody talk about DNS propagation, that's what they're talking about. Is that you have to wait for that change to go out to all of the new cache servers. Go ahead. Uh, yes, okay. everyone does. cPanel's to change it. Mm -hmm. it oh, Most often, yep. Okay. Yeah, because the, and that's one of the things that I actually covered yesterday in my in the cPanel training is that I think that that should be lowered to five minutes, because yeah. it's it does increase the amount of taxing or the amount of processing power that uh, caching name servers ha need if they're having to go look that up every time. But I think that it's it's worth it so that if I have to change something in my DNS, it propagates immediately. So that's probably like, to have it high would be incentive not to change? Yeah, if it's high, then, then, it's, then it's kind of a pain in the butt. It's, okay. Um, so are there any other factors at play there that would make it longer than that? I haven't been working long with the company that I'm working for, but I've heard some of the more um, people who've been there longer have said they've had just ridiculous times in the past. If it's if it's weeks, then there's something wrong with the configuration. So that's it's really the only factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that dnschecker.org there. If you go there and type in any domain you want, it queries a bunch of caching name servers all over the world, and it can tell you what the uh, the DNS like what's is. My DNS? Huh? Like what's my DNS? Yeah, the DNS checker does checks propagation. So not that's just DNS is another um, does it? Yeah. yeah, awesome. Website. Yeah, that's very cool. It, it is just literally says at this 
spot in Asia, your IP address is this. At this spot in South Africa, your IP is this. And it tells you, it can help you see, okay, it's only about half app propagated. Uh, one thing to just you know, if you, if you don't ever change your DNS, then having it for four hours. Right yeah, that's true. Yeah, right, if you don't yeah. change it that often. Right? Yeah. But it is annoying. Yeah. You know, if you know, like, I'm working on a new website, mm -hmm. and I know my website I'm going to launch in next weekend. I'm almost done. Next week I'm going to launch it. You can change that four hours to your five minutes, leave it, do your deployment, get that fast TTL, and then change it back afterwards, right? So you, mm -hmm. prepare. you can change it inside the CTL? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, you should be able to. And if you can't, it's, it's easy for your host to change. Okay. Just Thanks. prepare. A day. Yeah, that's I mean, really you know, four hours ahead of time. When you're, when you're yeah. launching a new site, you're like, when is it going to, when is it, yeah. Yeah. Or, you're yeah. or if somebody, you know, you're moving their domain from right. where the only, register to where their website is. You know, so. The only type of DNS record that is exempt from propagation is mail records. So if you change your DNS to point from one server to another, it, on just in the, where it's pointing the mail, where it's directing your email, that is an immediate change. So that, that's nice because it means that if you're moving from one server to another, you don't lose an email, right? It's not gone into the ether. You don't know where it is. Yeah, that's very fun. Um, so now everybody use the internet. You, 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 everybody uses the internet, whether or not you think you do. And now you know how that part works of it. If you want to go a little bit deeper, because I've only got a couple minutes left. I don't, can't dig too deep. Uh, the DNS zone entry types is a good thing to understand. A records, MX records, quad A records, uh, SPF, DKI, DKIM, that kind of stuff. Those are really, that's really good knowledge to have in your head. Uh, the difference between bind and power DNS. If you're, if you're running your own DNS server, those are really good things to understand. Uh, uh, if you, are interested in command line utilities, DIG and WHOIS are the most, uh, are the ones that I use the most. Understanding how to use them, the flags that go with them, what you can do, uh, what the information that you get out of it means, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I recommend digging into that. Uh, and if you need any help, uh, we have, this is mostly a like basic cPanel, where, where to go if you need help with, uh, with cPanel type stuff. Um, but any, if you have a cPanel server, then you can go to any of these places and we'll definitely be willing to help. If you have root access to your server, then you can open a ticket. Uh, and we have a Slack and a Discord server because we like to talk to folks, so that makes it fun. Um, I'll let her take a picture real quick. There you go. And if you need help, uh, obviously you can also reach out to me. I'm going to be slower, but I'm also always willing to, to answer questions and that kind of stuff. And make sure to stop by our booth tomorrow, if you didn't today. We're giving away gift cards. Uh, you can win a $20 gift, one of 10 $20 gift cards, which is pretty good odds in this, at this conference. Uh, and uh, we're also doing a trial for one of our license types, so definitely stop by. Uh, do you have any questions that you would like to ask me right now? Go for it. Quad A, Quad A is IPv6. So if you're using an IPv6 address, that's where you enter it. That's how you enter it. Anything else? Go ahead. Do you know the trace route? Oh yeah, trace route. Is that basically showing all of the jumps that your DNS is making? No. no, no. no. That that's what trace route does is more of a network path. So if I need to go to say you have a server and I need to get the information from you to my computer and I want to see how the traffic is going, like what, what wires it's traveling on, which, which routers it's going through, then that's what trace route is. Go ahead. And do you see the DNS path or the DNS mm -mm. thing? You can't look Not really. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think you can do dig trace, and I, but I don't think that that, I don't think it gives you that information. There's probably a way to do it. Uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. Go ahead. Um, so I've heard that there's a finite amount of IPv4s left. Mm -hmm. Why is that, or what makes a difference over IPv6? So it's uh, very briefly. It is 
limited because you only have a specific number of digits in each of the, the Is it try the whatever. Hmm? It's kind of beyond the scope of this conversation. Kind of, but not, I mean, it's just you, you, if, I, if you only have 100 numbers, then you only have 100 numbers, right? Yeah. So there, any combination of 1 to 255 in that, those four spots, that's an IP address. That means that you're limited. Sure. But it's just like Bill Gates said, we'll never need more than 64 megs of RAM. Like, yeah. <laughs> we've clearly outgrown that. And IP, IP addresses, same thing. We've wildly outgrown it. Uh, it's mostly just because, like, everything you own has an IP address. Your laptop, your computer, or your uh, desktop computer, your phone, your iPad. Like, everything has an IP address. And there are different ways to get around the limitations, but IPv6 brings it up to something insane, like many billions of IP addresses. Um, and because of, of the way that now there's four uh, uh, characters and they use letters too, and okay. it's, okay. it's a lot, it's a lot more robust. Yeah. Like, if you think about it, uh, something like 80% of the internet traffic uh, in India is all on mobile phones. And you know how many people are in India. Yeah. They all have their own IP address. Yeah. It's just an insane amount of, yeah. Any other questions? Cool.